And to that end, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. As we deal with this subject, today we're going to, to analyze love. And therefore, you have to go to 1 Corinthians 13. It's the most beautiful hymn of love ever written. I use it uh, in many of the marriage ceremonies that, that I am pleased to officiate. Uh, in the very first service I did, a wedding ceremony I did when I came here as pastor, it was soon after I arrived, and the church was packed, packed to the gills. And I used 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And one man was especially moved by those words. And he came out of the service, and with phenomenal enthusiasm, he said, that was the most amazing thing that you read. That was, that was beautiful. That was, that was absolutely perfect. And then he said, did you write that? <clears throat> now, here's where Satan comes into play. Because <clears throat> I was so tempted to say, well, yes, yes, I did, thank you. But I fought that off. And then I kind of had fun with that part because I said, no, that's right out of God's word. Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Well, he begins this, this, this discussion concerning God's love, this analysis of God's love by, by, by stating it doesn't matter how gifted you are, even though you speak with bravest fire, no matter how gifted you are, spiritual gifts, important gifts, if you have not love, you, it doesn't say it, it says you are nothing. Let us turn our attention to the reading of God's holy word. 1 Corinthians 13, the first three verses. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So in the church of Jesus Christ, you can be the, the greatest at, at preaching. You can have phenomenal biblical historical understanding. You can exercise great faith. You can be the greatest at giving. But without love, all of that amounts to nothing. As well as we amount to nothing. Ultimately, nothing before man. And most importantly, nothing before God. Well, that's the important foundation for our message. And I've often explained this as the first million dollar check that, that I ever received. It wasn't made out to me, unfortunately, but the company that I worked for, it was a contractual invention. There were incentives, there were penalties, they didn't quite live up to the contract, so they wrote us a check for one million dollars. Normally, I would never get that, but it actually came to my office. My secretary brought it in and said, I think you need to see this. And it sat on my credenza for the whole day. And one time, my secretary comes in, and I said, look at all those zeros. <clears throat> and be, I mean, it's a corporate check, not, not one that we would write, but it's big. And those zeros were awfully big. But I will tell you, all those zeros add up to what if there's nothing to the left side? If there's not a number to the left side, they all amount to zero. They all amount to nothing. And that's the way it is with having wonderful God-given gifts without love. It's like a, a check with ten zeros, but if there's nothing to the left, it is nothing. I've often been tempted to walk into the bank and present a check with all these zeros, but nothing to the left, just to watch the expression on a teller's face. You have enough zeros to pay off the national debt, but if there's not a digit to the left, it's all worth nothing. 
Well, all right, Paul, you've, you've made a dramatic and powerful point. But your powerful and dramatic point about the necessity of love obviously begs the question, well, what is divine love? What is godly love? And our passage today answers that question. We dealt with the hymn of Christ two weeks ago. Now we're dealing with the hymn of divine love today. And as you read this, it's important to note this is not a definition of love. Very difficult to come up with a, 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 a good definition of love. But as we come to verses 4 through 7, and we read this passage, it's not a definition of love, but it's a description of how love acts, of what love does. Now, every word that describes love here is a verb. And I was taught in grammar school that a verb is an action word. Action takes place. And therefore, every word that describes love, how it acts, how it looks, how it behaves, is all a verb. It's all an action word. And that's because love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a feeling. Love, if it's just a, uh, an emotion or just a feeling, a warm feeling, it's not love. You have to put that in action. In essence, having loving feelings without loving action is not love. So with that introduction, let us come to our text for today, which is verses 4 through 7. God's word says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Every city has one. In St. Louis, it was called the, the Sunshine Slowdown. <clears throat> and it was this point every time when I drove into downtown uh, St. Louis, when I was working in the, in the corporate world, you listened to the helicopter traffic reports. And the guy in St. Louis was very famous. He yelled at people all the time, get a move on, get that car off the road. Come on, you people, get with it. He was coaching people, and what was interesting is most people listen to him, so often they would do what he said. But on I-64, as you came into downtown St. Louis, there was a curve, and it was called the Sunshine Slowdown Curve. Because as soon as those many lanes of the interstate made that curve, the sunglasses went on, the visors came down, and the sun, or the hand goes up to, to block that one spot of sun that nothing can stop. And the reason was the sun in its bright, concentrated form, blinded you. And it caused accidents on, on a bad day. And on a great day, it didn't cause any accidents, but all the traffic slowed down. You could see the, the red lights ahead of you, and that was the shun, sunshine slowdown. And the point is that there is a blinding power of bright, concentrated light. So what do we need to see? We need light to see. But that same light can blind us unless it's diffused some way. And that's the way it is with divine love, agape love. In its undiffused form, it is so overwhelming, so powerful that, that it blinds us. And therefore, Paul, in the glory of Scripture and the leadership of the Spirit, breaks divine love down into 15 descriptive actions. Praise the Lord. The, the Bible is understandable. It's presented to us in a way that we can understand it and, and apply it. Well, how does he do this? Well, in essence, Paul takes the bright, concentrated light of, of God's love and he holds a prism up to it. Now, what's a prism do with, with bright white light? It breaks it down into seven Beautiful colors. Now, Brother David Ma, he's got the PhD in, in physics. He can explain all of that to you. But they go at different speed, light 
the colors go at different speed through the glass and therefore it separates and you see this array of colors. And when I was in elementary school and the teacher held it up and, and showed the light on the wall, well, I knew it was some kind of trick. So in my, whatever it was, second grade inquisitiveness, uh, as we went out to recess, I went over and picked that thing up. I was trying to figure out how they did the trick. No trick. The prism breaks down the bright light, white light, into the seven colors in that spectrum. And, and the Apostle Paul does the same thing, except rather than seven colors, he gives us the 15 descriptive actions of God's love that are be present in our life to reveal how we are to properly love. These 15 colors tell you and me how we are to love, how we're not to love. So these, uh, these are easily understood. And I praise the Lord for that. They're easily understood, and therefore they can be properly applied in our lives. And just because they're easily understood, it does not mean that they are not overwhelmingly profound in their impact on our life. Now, as often as the case, the scripture breaks down into sections. We have three sections in these, these verses here. The first section is two positive statements of how love is. And we're going to entitle that, Love is Others Oriented. And then the next section is eight negative statements of how love isn't. And we're going to entitle that section, Love is Not Human Nature. And then finally, we have the final five positive statements. Again, it tells you how love is, and we're going to entitle that with that love endures. Now, in each of these sections, I'm going to make a, a general observation, and then I'm going to make a specific observation from each of these sections. So let's look at the first two positive statements of how love is. And remember, this is love is others-oriented. Look at verse number four, the first phrase. Love suffers long and is kind. We can say love is patient and kind. Now those two statements are two sides of the same coin. That's very important. The first says that, that love is patient and therefore it will, it will take anything from others. The second says love is kind and therefore it will give everything needed to others. So both of them are other-oriented, patient and kind. Now let's get the specific application. Why write that to the Corinthian church? Well, I will tell you, the Corinthian church was phenomenally blessed. It was wealthy beyond compare concerning spiritual gifts. They had them in abundance, amazingly. However, there was something missing. And that was love. They were the example, the biblical example of being a self-centered congregation. Everything was done to, to elevate self. So the first two colors of this divine rainbow of, of God's love strikes right at the heart of the Corinthian problem. But often it strikes right at the heart of our modern day problem, our personal challenge as well. Now I want to concentrate on the second side of that coin, that, that love suffers long. Long-suffering, patient, means patient with people, not necessarily patient with circumstances. There are circumstances that need to be addressed often, and we need to get with it. But we are to suffer long or be patient with people while we work long and hard to change circumstances for the better. And the long-suffering and patience identified here never retaliates and never seeks revenge. Now, this is a term, this word that was used here in the New Testament was a new word. And it was a new word because it applied to those born again of God's Holy Spirit. You see, they were different. They were transformed. They were new creatures in Christ. And therefore, they had a patient, long-suffering spirit with people. Now, some people have criticized that and said, you know, those Christians, they just made up words. Yeah, because there was a new reality that needed to be expressed. Now, I, uh, there are some people this, this won't work with, but 
30 years ago, how many of you regularly used the word internet or e-commerce or, or email? Not very long ago, none of you Facebooked. Now a lot of you Facebook. And it would have been ridiculous 30 years ago to say, well, why don't you Google that? Well, we've made up those words. Why? Because there's a new reality. The new reality, in fact, all of those things has dramatically changed our world. Well, the fact that Christ is alive in born-again believers was changing the world at that time, and they suffered long and were patient with people, and it needed to be expressed. So that's the word. And Paul goes on two times in, in 2 Corinthians, the next book, to tell us that patience was the hallmark. He was suffering long in his ministry. Patience was the hallmark of his personal ministry. But in the book of Ephesians, he goes on to, to say that not only was he patient in his ministry, but you and I as Christians are to have patience characterize our lives as well. Well, why is that, Apostle Paul? Well, it's because our Father in heaven is the supreme example of a long-suffering, patient spirit. And our Father in heaven is the sovereign enabler of you and I having a patient and long-suffering heart with people. You see, God is in action through patience. Psalms 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Here it's right in the description of who God is. It's his nature. As Brother Jim said in, in his prayer, it's the essence of God. One of, my, one of my favorite illustrations of this, I was born in Illinois. It's called the land of Lincoln, if you didn't know that. The land of Lincoln. One of Abraham Lincoln's earliest political uh, enemies and adversaries was Edwin Stanton. And Edwin Stanton pulled no punches. He was a nasty little man. He called Lincoln a low cunning clown, a stupid clown. He called him a, repeatedly a gorilla. He had vicious personal attack after personal attack. And Lincoln never ever responded to any of those personal slanders and attacks. And after elected president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln appointed Edwin Stanton to his cabinet. And his personal, uh, his very close personal political advisors were furious as this man lost his mind. Why in the world did you do that? And Abraham Lincoln's response was very simple. Best man for the job. End of discussion. Well, years later, Abraham Lincoln lay in state. And Edward Stanton makes his way to the coffin and he stands over the coffin and the report is that he, with tears streaming down his face, Edwin Stanton said, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever known. Stanton's hatred and slander and, and disgust was, was finally broken by Lincoln's long-suffering, patient, non-retaliatory spirit. You see, patient love won over slander and hate. Brothers and sisters, we, we serve a patient, long-suffering God. And therefore, we are called to be patient with those around us. You and I can never, ever win in Christian battles when hate and revenge are our foremost motivation. We can only win. We can only win battles that honor Christ through love in action. We fight the war with different rules in our households, in the church, in the workplace, in our neighborhoods. Love is others oriented. That's our, our first observation. The, the second one now we move to, to the eighth description of what love is not. And I've entitled this, Love is Not Human Nature. And that just begs lots of questions, doesn't it? We'll look at the middle of verse 4 and through the first phrase of verse number 6. Love does not envy. 
Love does no rotten, does, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. So what we here have here are these eight descriptions of what human nature is so inclined to do in, in many different situations. Love does not envy and, and is not jealous. Now my pulpit description of, of jealousy is, is, it includes, you know, you have this and I want that and therefore I am jealous. But I think a more searching description of jealousy is another person is being blessed and we're not happy about it. That's an important question for us to ask. Are we happy when other people are blessed? It goes on, love, love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. It does not act rudely and crudely. Our society needs to have a lesson in not acting rudely and crudely. It doesn't try to get its own way. You know, you can look, think of numerous examples. You can even think of sweet little toddler babies that have the sweet little toddler neighborhood baby come over and everything in the room becomes what? Mine. <clears throat> no, I, you can't play with that. That's mine, so I take that toy away from you. You pick up another one, I take that away from you. And it's like, what's happening to my sweet little baby? It's called human nature. Hummingbirds. The big bad hummingbird guards that you know, hummingbird feeder and drives away all the hummingbirds. Why? Because uh, I want it. I want to get my own way. It goes on, love is not easily provoked. Love must not keep uh, a record of wrongs suffered. That's often a part of premarital counseling and postmarital counseling. They spend time keeping track of, of wrongs suffered. It's a recipe for disaster. Love does not enjoy sin in themselves or, or others. It does not rejoice in iniquity. That's an important one. It comes right to us out of the, the Beatitudes as well. Well, the key to all of these warnings, I, I think, can, can, can be summed up by the fifth one, which is, does not seek its own. Right in the middle of verse 5. Does not seek its own. Love seeketh not her own. Love does not try to get its own way. It's not narcissistic. The root of our sinful humanity all started in the, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve did what? Strive to got, get their own way. They wanted their own way. If we cure selfishness, we've just replanted the, the Garden of Eden. The fall of humanity into sin came about when Adam and Eve rejected God's way so that they could have their own way. So self replaced God, and that's the opposite of righteousness, and that's the opposite of love. So love is not preoccupied with its own things, but with the interest of others. Now the Corinthians, as I said, had, had, had taken selfishness to new heights. The Apostle Paul takes them out behind the woodshed and gives them what for, because when they had fellowship dinners, they didn't share their food. Now, it's been way too long since we've had a fellowship dinner, isn't it? I miss our fellowship dinners. Well, their fellowship dinner would look something like that. No, that's my green bean casserole. Don't you dare touch it. No, that's my roast potatoes and carrots and onions. That's ours. Don't touch it. Don't you be touching that sushi over there. And that's the way they did it. They brought their own and they ate their own and they did not share. Can you imagine that? What a disaster that would be. They sued their fellow church members in pagan courts. They wanted the best perceived spiritual gifts for themselves. And they didn't want to use spiritual gifts to build up the greater body of Christ as it's designed, but they wanted the best spiritual gifts to elevate themselves, to build themselves up. Jesus is always is our perfect example. We hear the words of, of Jesus, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Brothers and sisters, in, in serving, we share the divine love that God has placed in our hearts. And to not share that love by not serving is to wither and die. Now I'm going to say that again because you need to get that. We all need to get that. I need to, I need to hear that over and over. In serving, we share the divine love that God has placed in our hearts. 
and to not share that divine love is to begin to wither and die. Now, there are a lot of illustrations of this point. I don't think I'm going to use any of them because I want to focus on the application. I want you to think about that. It doesn't matter whether you're 14, 44, or 94. When you stop sharing the divine love that God has placed in your heart by not serving, you begin to wither and die. And it doesn't matter what age, what stage of life that you're in. This is an important question for us to ask us because those filled with vibrance are involved in, in, in sharing and giving away the love of God within them by serving one another, by caring for one another, by being a blessing in other people's lives. Many of the illustrations that make this point often end with a statement such as this. I am so much better now. I, I have vibrancy. I, I'm filled with joy. I have physical health. And the doctors can't figure out why, but I know why. And that is, I now have something to live for other than myself. When our eyes are on self, we begin to wither and die. Very important concept. As Christians, we have our, our Father in heaven to live for. As Christians, we have Christ as our example of how to live and how to serve and how to love. We have the Holy Spirit as the one that empowers us to be able to accomplish all of that for God's glory, for the good of the church, and for our own well-being. And to that end, we must keep our eyes focused on heaven where our Father is, focused on Christ as Lord and Savior. Because when we take our eyes off of God, our eyes always naturally make their way to us. And we see self. We fail to serve. We become selfish. We definitely seek our own. And we wither and die. That's pretty negative, Pastor. Well, let me give you the positive slant on that. When our eyes are on Christ, when our eyes are on Christ, life is, is full of love that we can so aggressively give away through service. The more we give, the more we have to give. And that's, that's biblical mathematics. The more we give away, the more we have to give away. We have a, an infinite bank account. We have the riches of glory. It's all ours. The more our eyes are on Christ, the more we look like Christ, the more we act like Christ, the more we sound like Christ. And the more our eyes are on Christ, the 15 colors of love begin to give our lives a phenomenal color and an amazing vibrance. We live lives that are fulfilling and joyful and filled with satisfaction and peace that surpasses human understanding. Love is not human nature. But now we come to the third section, which is love endures. <clears throat> there are five positive descriptions of love in action. Look at the second phrase of verse 6 all the way through the end of verse 7. But rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now this is called hyperbole, a literary exaggeration for a point, and you need to understand it. Paul has made clear that love rejects a lot of things. Love rejects jealousy and bragging and arrogance and selfishness and anger and resentment and unrighteousness and sin. Love rejects those. Therefore, love does not bear, nor does it believe or hope or endure lies or false teaching or anything else that is not of God. But when he says all things here, Paul is speaking about all things acceptable to God, God's righteousness and, and God's will, the truth. And therefore, these four qualities are closely related and they're kind of in ascending order. Love bears what is otherwise unbearable. And I stand amazement, in amazement at so many brothers and sisters in Christ that I know well in, in this congregation, but in other congregations and throughout my life. I stand amazement of how they have gone through phenomenal trials and stood so strong. They have 
born the unbearable. And that's what love does. Love believes what is unbelievable. It will trust when nothing else will. Love hopes in what is otherwise a, a hopeless situation. And love endures when anything less than love would, would give up. At this point, I often think of the, the women coming to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning. Their faith had died, their hope had died, but their love for that person of Jesus Christ, the Master, Rabboni, drew them to the mouth do them to the mouth of that grave, that tomb, and there they witnessed the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Their love endured. Stephen the martyr, Stephen preaching the gospel, the one stoned. The Apostle Paul was looking on. Stephen, Stephen lovingly bore the ridicule and, and the rejection of those that he preached to, their taunts and their, their catcalls, but soon. Those words turned to, to stones. And even the stones would not stop him from preaching. And even as he neared death, that did not end his love. And in the midst of having his body struck and battered and beaten with those stones that would bring death, he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. His love endured. just like his Lord and Savior, just like the words of the cross. Stephen loved to the very end the enemies who put him to death. His love endured. And our love, just like that, must endure. Our love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our love of the church, our love of, of God's word and the righteousness and, and growing in grace. Our love of one another in the body of Christ. That love, our love, must never end. It must endure. The words of this passage are so very beautiful as the man at the wedding said, no I did not write it, God did. So let us look at the passage of scripture once again and just pause and ponder as we hear these words. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. But love rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And in that passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul holding up that divine prism, has divided the bright, glowing, concentrated light of divine, godly love, agape. And he breaks it down into 15 beautiful colors that tell us how to love, tell us how love acts, and tells us how we are to act. But he's done more than that. I love this thought that through the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. And we see these 15 colors of divine love. It's as if the Apostle Paul has that palette and has that brush in his hand and he's painting a portrait. And as that portrait begins to form and come together, we see that it is a portrait of none other than Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Each color brings out a more beautiful aspect of Christ's personality and Christ's person in Christ's love, and Christ's power, and his mercy, and his grace. But here's where it gets real personal. It's more than simply a portrait of Jesus Christ, as glorious as that is. Through the work of God's Holy Spirit, applying these colors to our lives, it becomes a portrait of every born-again believer in Christ Jesus. It becomes a, a portrait of you. It becomes a, a portrait of me. It's a portrait of Christ in us and a portrait of us in Christ, in and through Jesus Christ. These four verses in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians tell us how we are to look, how we are to appear to all of those around us. 
And I will tell you, when you have that appearance, when this is your portrait, you are the most beautiful, you are the most appealing of all persons, and your life is filled with divine color and divine vibrance. And your life is a life of divinely enabled love. The absolutely essential ingredient of the Christian life.